I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter, on the latest in Israel's war in Gaza, what Israel has accomplished, what Hamas has accomplished, we have with us Dan Byman, who's a senior fellow at CSIS in our Transnational Threats Program, and he's also a professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dan, welcome to the podcast. You're just back from Israel, where you were meeting with Israeli security officials. What can you tell us? So, not surprisingly, the mood in Israel is grim. I've been to Israel many times over many decades now, and I've never seen a country that is in such pain. There's obviously fury at Hamas, but there's also a tremendous sense of anger at the poor performance of the intelligence service and military, and a lot of anger at politicians. And, of course, Israel at the same time is coming together. The country feels it's at war. The reserves have been called up with lots of people, sons and daughters fighting. And as a result, you have both a sense of pain and division, but also a sense of unity. And describe what that unity is like. I mean, parents are sending their sons and daughters off to war. Some of them are already at war. Country's economy is really in some jeopardy. How are Israelis getting through all this? So it's exceptionally difficult for them. And let me add one more thing that honestly I didn't fully appreciate until I was there, which is, you know, several hundred thousand people have left their homes in the south near Gaza, but also the north because they're afraid of attacks from Hezbollah, which has been launching rockets and missiles at Israel. And so you have hundreds of thousands of people displaced, hundreds of thousands called up from the reserves, and of course, the tremendous trauma of the attack itself. So life has been turned upside down, universities are not having classes, and people are you know, tremendously concerned about the safety of their families, whether at home or fighting in Gaza. And so every conversation begins with this concern, both about the past and the attack Israel suffered, but also about the likely casualties facing Israel, the fate of the over 100 Israelis who are still in Hamas captivity, and the broader question of the security of the country. You met with Israeli security officials. Did they show you some of the things that they are doing? And what did they give you a sense about the military's morale and about its planning? So in my view, one of the good things, but one of the characteristic things about talking to 10 Israelis is you'll get 100 different opinions. So in contrast to many other countries where you get kind of a standard, you know, here's what's going on. Here we had opinions all over the map. So we went all over. We got a sense of military efforts in both the areas near Gaza, but also in Hezbollah, um, concerns Israelis have about the West Bank. We talked to lots of officials about how they're feeling on accountability in the Israeli system and also how the war itself is going in Gaza, where Israelis feel a sense of accomplishment in some ways, but there's also a tremendous number of problems or areas where they feel they um, have to do better. So tell us, the Israeli campaign in Gaza has been extremely destructive. Why has it been so destructive? So as we're recording this podcast, the guess is about 20,000 Palestinians in Gaza have died, many of them children, and in any event, many of them non-combatants of various sorts. It's tremendously destructive. You have huge percentages of the Strip are in ruins. You have hunger you have disease starting to spread. It's it's horrible for Gazans. And just as I said, this attack seemed to reach every corner of Israeli society. Gaza is even smaller. The death toll is much higher. So the suffering is really tremendous. There are several reasons for the destructiveness of the Israeli campaign, some of which I think listeners will accept, others they'll be more skeptical of. So one reason is that Hamas has spent years since it took power in 2007 preparing for this attack. So there are huge numbers of Hamas strong points, ammunition caches, fortified areas, sniper positions, and of course, massive tunnels throughout the Strip. So everywhere Israel is going, it's encountering fighters who are able to resist very effectively and to destroy those fighting positions and that broader military capacity therefore requires destruction in lots of areas. In addition, the Strip itself is incredibly densely populated. And even though much of the population fled the fighting, much of it did not. And so it's hard to destroy a military target when right next to it is a civilian target. 
And also Hamas has encouraged this by deliberately co-locating civilian and military targets. So whether it's schools or mosques or other facilities, Hamas has exploited international rules that say you don't put military facilities there in order to discourage Israeli targeting. So when Israel attacks Hamas positions, often it's falling into a trap it can't avoid, which is, from Israel's point of view, is a military necessity. But much of the world looking out says, hey, this is a ruined school, not a military target. I would add a few more things, though. One is that many of the Israelis fighting are reserves. There wasn't tremendous preparation for this campaign. And as a result, Israel is making mistakes. And sometimes these are small, but sometimes they're quite grievous. There is a tremendous sense of Israeli fury. And while at least I hope this hasn't led to deliberate attacks on civilians, except in what I hope are isolated cases, it certainly has led to greater willingness to tolerate Palestinian civilian casualties in exchange for going after military targets. So there is always a trade-off between should we target this individual who is a military commander if killing him leads to the risk of civilian death? And the question is how important is the commander and also how many civilians might be affected? The ratios, though, have varied historically for Israel, and now they're much higher. So it's much more willing to inflict civilian harm in exchange for what it feels is military advantage. So these are a lot of reasons But the result has been tremendous devastation on the Strip, even as Israeli officials claim they've killed a lot of Hamas fighters and some leaders. And so tell me about that. How is their campaign going against Hamas's leadership and against Hamas's fighters? So Hamas, there are different estimates, but a common one is around 25,000 to 30,000 fighters under arms. And Israel has claimed when I was there that it's killed around a quarter of these. And there are a lot of different ways to do estimates and one should be very careful of these numbers, but but let's take these as roughly in the ballpark. But another question is simply, how many of these are senior figures in Hamas who are much harder to replace? So whether that's very skilled operatives, whether that's leaders who can give orders, Israel has claimed it's killed several battalion commanders of Hamas, that it's otherwise made some progress, but here it's been much more limited. The most senior leaders that Israel is seeking, Mahamadif, the commander of Hamas's military wing, uh, Sinwar, the overall leader of Hamas, these have escaped Israeli retaliation so far and may simply be hiding out. But these are not only important for Hamas as an organization, they're important symbols. So Americans may recall the kind of hunt for bin Laden. And over the decade after 9-11, bin Laden was not involved in many al-Qaeda operations, but he was nonetheless a symbol for the group. He was providing overall strategic direction. And people like Sinwar are those symbols for Israel. So there is benefit militarily from Israel from killing them, but there's also benefit symbolically from doing so. And Dan, you know, we've seen in recent days, you know, some of the hospitals that have been destroyed actually have been occupied pretty significantly by Hamas and its leadership. What are the Israelis saying about that? And how hard is it for them to prosecute this campaign when Hamas leaders are hiding in plain sight in hospitals, when they're hiding among civilian populations? You know, their version of hiding out is subterranean. It might even be with the hostages that Israel is trying to liberate. What is that like for them? So this causes tremendous problems for the Israeli military and for Israel's image around the world, where Israelis feel that rather than Hamas being blamed for deliberately putting military assets in a civilian location, that Israel is blamed when it tries to go after those military assets and the hospital or the school or whatever it is, is damaged or destroyed. And frankly, this Hamas tactic works. There is no question that in the vast majority of the world, People look at the destruction of a hospital and simply find it inexcusable, no matter what photo Israel shows of a Hamas weapons depot or fighter or tunnel there. And so this is something that we see terrorist groups doing all the time, which is they try to exploit the reaction of their enemy and they try to claim victim status even though they themselves are often the first ones responsible for much of the damage. And understandably, Israelis find this very frustrating, but it's also not a surprise. Hamas has done this for really for for decades now. And it's something that simply Israel has to accept that this is unfair and they're going to have to deal with this perception problem. And it should, in my view, shape their targeting that this is going to mean that Israel will at times have to take on more risk to avoid destruction, even if Hamas is the one ultimately responsible for co-locating these assets. I want to make an additional point about the hostages, though, because to me, that's a huge point. 
Anywhere you go in Israel, you see posters with pictures of those who are still captive in Gaza. Reports of those who have been released are often horrifying about the treatment they received. And so understandably, this is an overwhelming Israeli concern. And it's very hard to do military operations when you have to worry about killing your own people. And Israel has killed some of its own people, accidentally, of course. And there are probably more dead and dumb as it know about who died in a bombing or something like that. And so this is always a dilemma, which is if the hostages are around a senior leader, for example, how does Israel handle that challenge? And in many cases, Israel simply doesn't know. So it might find a location of a senior leader. It may not know if there's a hostage around it. So far, in contrast to past military campaigns, Israel has been much more willing to risk the lives of hostages and its own soldiers. And I think that reflects the Israeli sense that this is a much more existential conflict that is just not simply a campaign as there were in several in the last 15 years, which was really meant to teach Hamas a lesson and go back to the status quo ante. This is much more of Hamas must be destroyed, and therefore Israelis are far more willing to pay what, for a small country, is a very high price. And so let's talk about that. What does destroying Hamas mean to Israelis in practice? So Israelis, in my view, haven't fully fleshed out what this actually means. And we heard different answers from different people. So one approach is to destroy the day-to-day military power of Hamas. And let's go back to those twenty-five to 30,000 fighters. Israel obviously isn't going to kill or capture all of them. But if it can inflict heavy casualties, it can destroy their combat effectiveness. And that doesn't eliminate them, but it makes it far harder for them to certainly to do a repeat of something like October 7th, but also to resist whatever government takes power in the Strip. Another way is to focus on leadership, and Israel historically has done this with terrorist groups, where it's done assassination campaigns, it's focused on arrests on senior figures, and this is a variant of going after the bulk of fighters, where you're hoping again to disrupt the organization by having you know individuals who might be angry, but they're not coordinated, they don't become trained, and as a result, they're much less lethal. But then you get to some more indirect approaches. One is Hamas as an ideology. And the ideology is that what is necessary is resistance, which Hamas would define as constant violent operations against Israel and other foes. And here, I think Israel is doing worse and perhaps inevitably than it was before October 7th. The idea of resistance and that Israel needs to pay a very heavy price for its military operations has grown with many people delighted by Hamas's successful operation on October 7th, and many people furious about the casualties in the Israeli response. So there's tremendous support among many Palestinians for continued fighting against Israel. And I think this is especially true among Palestinians in the West Bank who are not bearing the brunt of the fighting, who have the advantage over their Gazan co-nationals in that they don't have to suffer the day-to-day destructiveness of a military campaign. The last way to think about destroying Hamas comes in terms of governance, where Hamas for the last 17 years has been the government of the Gaza Strip and the world has not recognized as such. But in terms of the most basic functions, like providing law and order or picking up the trash, it's been Hamas that's done this. And Israel wants to replace Hamas as the government. And this, again, is a huge challenge without a good answer. There isn't a logical new government to take over. And any government that does is going to have to deal with the remnants of Hamas, however strong they are, trying to undermine the government and eventually seize power again. And so does Israel have metrics of success spelled out? To my knowledge, no. At least I haven't seen it in public statements and different individuals I talked to gave different metrics. So I myself think of it from the interviews I held there in different ways. So some are simply about Hamas's military power, Hamas's leadership, as we talked about. But we also need to think about Israel's broader deterrence, and that includes the Houthis who have been trying to attack Israel from Yemen. It includes especially the Lebanese Hezbollah, who have been doing rocket and missile and other attacks across the Israeli border. It's also important to think about Israel's international reputation, which has suffered tremendously in Europe, also been criticism among many circles in the United States. And I would say the Biden administration has moved closer to Israel than it was before October 7th. But for the most part, the world has looked at what has happened and seen Israel as the aggressor here. And the last thing I would say is Israel needs to restore faith in its own institution, that the failure of the security services, the failure of the military, the criticism of the politicians, That's something that you need strong public support for these institutions in order to fight the fear that is part of what terrorists try to promulgate. 
So it's very important for Israel to be able to tell its own people they are safe. And that requires trusting their own institutions. Do you get the sense that the Israelis are hoping for a political change soon? Is there dissatisfaction with Netanyahu uh, and his performance since October 7th? Certainly. And if you look at opinion polls, Netanyahu's approval rating has cratered and he himself has refused to take responsibility for the October 7th attacks. He's been reluctant to meet with families of hostages and in general has treated this more as a politician than as a statesman. But let me add a few things. First of all, his coalition seems fairly stable. So it's not a question of him having to resign because his coalition is going to abandon support. Now, that could change quickly. Politics in Israel are volatile. And there is widespread anger at Netanyahu that preexisted October 7th. So I could easily see him crashing down as a result. The caveat I would add is even if Netanyahu himself loses power, more conservative voices in Israel are likely to become stronger in the coming years. There are some figures in government, some listeners may know names like Ben Gvir and Smotrich, who are, in my view, radical extremists who are openly racist. And there's a lot more support for these positions, for the idea that Palestinians cannot be trusted in terms of security, at worst are subhuman. And the October 7th attacks, their scale, the ferocity of them, the brutality of them have strengthened these voices. So for many Americans who are critics of Netanyahu and might be delighted to see him fall, the result is not necessarily going to be a more liberal government. It might be a more conservative one, although there are a hundred different possibilities of who could take power next. So it's very difficult to predict exactly the shape of the next government. Dan, finally, I want to ask you about Hamas itself. What has Hamas accomplished since October 7th? So Hamas has done, I'll say, several accomplishments that are unfortunately quite impressive. So one is it punctured the Israeli sense that they didn't need to deal with the Palestinians. I think three months ago, Israelis would have said, yeah, there are the Palestinians, but, but Gaza itself is largely contained. And we are making tremendous progress in terms of normalization with the Arab world and our economy is doing well and we have our own problems, but the Palestinians are not particularly high on the list. And no one is saying that now. Israel has to deal with the Palestinians one way or another. Hamas also improved its reputation, at least temporarily, within the Palestinian community. Its action against Israel, the Israeli response, have strengthened Hamas's pitch that it is the one standing up to Israel. And this contrasts with the Palestinian Authority, which has negotiated with Israel and has not supported terrorism. And as a result, the voices that are for relative moderation are weaker. And the Palestinian Authority has a 100 problems unrelated to Israel. But Israel's own policies in the past also undermined the Palestinian Authority and made that problem worse. I would also add that Hamas has changed the broader regional environment. There was hope that there might be normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. For now, at least, that's on the back burner. And I think even more importantly, the narrative has changed. When people talked about Iran before October 7th, it was often about Iran's support for regimes like Syria that were killing its own people. Now it's much more that Israel is the villain in countries like Iran and groups like Hezbollah and Hamas that Iran support. These are the heroic organizations, and that's a conversation that Iran very much wants. I would close simply by saying that whatever Hamas has gained, the people of Gaza have paid a staggering price for it. And their suffering is something that it's really hard to overstate. And Hamas was willing to make its own political gains knowing that the people of Gaza would suffer and pay the price for what Hamas was doing. You know, it's not lost on the Israelis that there's an enormous amount of suffering that is going on in Gaza as a result of their campaign in Gaza. I know that Israelis view Hamas as an existential threat that isn't going away unless they take care of it. But how is the Israeli public viewing the damage in Gaza at the moment? So the Israeli public looks at October 7th and looks at what is he says, the brutality of the attacks and believes that the campaign in Gaza is vital for their own security. And they believe the statements of their leaders that the only way to destroy Hamas is to go after its infrastructure and its fighters, which in turn will be incredibly destructive. And they're looking at their sons and daughters fighting and they don't want them to take more risk. They don't want to say, you know, go ahead, risk your life in order to make your Palestinian equivalent safer. So ordinary Israelis are very willing to have a destructive campaign in Gaza if it means keeping them safe. And so there is tremendous support for the military campaign, even if it is very destructive. 
Dan, thank you so much for these tremendous insights. And, you know, especially having just returned from Israel, I think they're extremely valuable for our listeners. Thank you so much. My pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 